And I started this business about 35 years ago when we have a country house in Hunter, New York, and the family skied and I stayed home because skiing was not my thing and I cooked and baked and made more pies and cakes than girls would eat so we started selling them to the local restaurants and that was the beginning of becoming a baker. Now being a baker is one thing and the other thing is to do a decorated cake that looks beautiful. At the time I went into this business you could have one or the other. You couldn't have both. You were either a cake decorator and your cakes were probably inedible, or you were a terrific baker, but they didn't look like much. So the object was to combine both. So that's why I consider myself a baker slash cake decorator. In 1980, I had breast cancer and we lived on Long Island. And it was difficult to travel back and forth. So we decided we would sell the house on the island because the kids were out of the house. Everybody was on their own. And we came into New York and my husband thought he would be a real estate tycoon, which by the way, never happened. And uh, I would sort of piddle around, be in chemotherapy, bake cakes as extra mind therapy. And it turned out that the mind therapy and cakes took over and the chemo worked. So here we are, healthy, alive, and vibrant in the cake business. I got to know when cake was successful and could be a business for me is when I got picked up by a couple of the hotels. I, originally, I did a cake or two for a caterer who entertained some very uh, ladies who dined and lunched. And one of them brought a cake to the Carlisle Hotel. And the banquet manager at that time had never seen a cake that was beautiful and so delicious to eat. So she contacted me for one or two and I got picked up by the Pierre Hotel and the Plaza Hotel. So gradually the, uh, the checkbook got filled, the bank balance got filled honored and uh, I was off and running in business. So you know what it is? It's a matter of the right product at the right time in the right place and a lot of luck. I meet with a bride and groom or with a client who wants a special cake and we sit down and we talk to them about what they envision. What do they see? Where is it being held? What is the season? Do they have favorite flowers? Do they have a favorite theme? What does the gown look like? Uh, and then we'll work with the elements to see if they like it. And we'll do a couple of sketches, and sometimes we take a piece from A and a piece from B, and we do an amalgam, look for them, so that we try to get as close to what they visualize as their special occasion cake. Now, not all our cakes are weddings. We do birthdays and anniversaries. So sometimes it personifies who they are. So it's all very personalized and generally one of a kind. My favorite part of the business, I think, is meeting the brides and grooms or the clients that we have because I get to get friendly with them. I get insights into their way of life. We meet people that come from all over the world. We can have a bride from India and a groom from Japan or South America who has an interesting job. They're into uh, philanthropy, they're into banking, which is the least interesting but they're designers or they're scientists or it's just something about every client that comes in that becomes a unique personality to us. I don't have a particular favorite cake. It's probably the last one we do because it's, we get better and better as we do them. So I think 300 Fabergé eggs that went to the Russian embassy in Washington is a cake I will remember. I think Jurassic Park animals on a little boy's 13th birthday cake is something I will remember. Uh, there are designs that we do that I think are unique, so we do get to remember them very well. When I go along to deliver a cake, I'm walking into an extended family meeting. I know the florist, I know the photographer, or they know of me, the banquet people, the waiters especially in territory where I'm there frequently. And they all gather around and how are you and how have you been and how's your husband, how are the kids, 
and it becomes this wonderful extended relationship that is really very meaningful to me. You know, I don't, I'm not sure what a celebrity in the business means. What it means is that I've been doing this for over 30 years. We have produced a great product. We keep getting better and better. We, we push the envelope as far as we can go, and we care about what we deliver. So if that means celebrity staying power and quality and humility and gratefulness and part of a team player, then I'll accept the word. But we're not divas, and we work very hard to please our client, and we go out of our way to do that. There is a story about these glasses that everybody wants to know about, and it's because I was walking down the street one day on Worth Avenue in Florida, and I saw these enormous glasses in a window, and I went in to check them out. My husband said, don't even check them out, you're gonna look like an opossum. I said, but I like them, they're big, and I was wearing contact lenses, and I hated contact lenses. And then about two years later, I found out that they could get me horn instead of plastic. Now a horn glass, this is one piece of horn, it's not a seam. It took two years for them to find it. It is lightweight, and this is the one pair I own. Of course, it was quite expensive, and my husband was aghast. He said, that's a lot of money for an eyeglass frame. I said, but think of it, when I wear these, I don't need big diamond earrings. Look at the money you're saving. So. This became a joke in the family. I don't have the dangling earrings. I am very lucky. Uh, because I'm in this business and because we do a good product and because I like people, we get free press. I have never paid for public relations. So we had a very nice write-up in Cranes. We had a nice write-up in The Post. We get write-ups in Martha Stewart's, Town and Country, uh, Brides magazines, The Cunningest, and we get a lot of TV exposure with The Knot, uh, Martha Stewart on TV. So we're very lucky that way. I think we're considered the leaders in our field, and that's quite a compliment, and we're very grateful for what we get. Do I like myself most of the time? Yes. Uh, do I feel inadequate at times? Absolutely. And I hope that continues for the rest of my life because nobody's perfect. And if you think you're perfect, then you become what we call a diva. And that is the bottom of my list. I'm a life member now, thank goodness, of NACE, but they're smart because of my age. They're not gonna lose much money on this one. What's so interesting is to find that you may have two hotels that might be rivals, but the banquet people, our executives, are friends through NACE and will help each other. So if somebody wants something on the same date, someone from the Marriott or the Grand Hyatt will go to someone at the plaza or another of the hotels and give it to them. And it's that sharing that is so important in an organization. And I think every head of the food and beverages and banquet departments, et cetera, should join NACE. I, should, I don't think it should be voluntary. I really think it should be compulsive because there is so much to learn from it. People tend to get stuck in a job and in a role and in a position and they think that's it. But this organization can open their eyes to much more so you know what's going on around the country and you're not in a cocoon. Well, if, the only thing I really have to say is you pretty much pay for what you get. I mean, I came out of the um, Midwest not too long ago where their idea of a salad was macaroni and mayonnaise. Now, what's going on in this country? Why are we feeding people stuff that's going to kill them? So my issue is to serve the best food, smaller portions, healthy stuff, and the best quality you can do. And I think as a catering organization, that's what we should push.